Welcome to our regular weekly Bible study program. Thank you for joining us. Last week we had a pre-recorded program because I was traveling, but we're back to a live broadcast now on Facebook. And If you're watching this live, please consider sending in whatever Bible questions you may have and we will do our best to address them as part of this program. I have some questions that were already pre-submitted and I will launch into those in just a moment. But we always begin with prayer and there's just so much that we need to be praying about. Uh, there are families in this body that are carrying very heavy burdens right now. There are very precious saints that are nearing the end of their life and it's difficult times. There are those who have sicknesses and diseases that really need divine intervention. And there's just so many needs, but there's a mighty God in heaven who loves and who cares. And if we ask anything according to his will, the Bible says that he hears us. And so we want to ask according to the will of God, that he would intervene and help, that he would also touch our minds that we might understand what he's telling us in his holy word. And that's the, the purpose of this program is to look into the Bible and gain a greater, greater understanding of God's word. So would you join me in this brief prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before the throne of grace with a right of access that was purchased by blood on Mount Calvary. It was Jesus who made a way for us to come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Lord, there are so many needs that we have through this body, and you're so good, so kind, so gracious, so merciful. And we're praying that your grace and your mercy would extend to the many cases that, that are on our hearts, the many situations that you know about. Lord, let your grace be sufficient. In all of this, we know that it's the will of the Lord that be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not our will, but your will, dear Lord. But please touch us to understand the great things that you have in your word. This Bible is such an awesome book. It contains such great truths. And I pray again, Lord, that you would touch our minds to give us understanding that we might see what you're saying to us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> well, again, feel free to submit questions as comments to this Facebook post if you would like us to address them tonight. Or you may, uh, if you're watching this, Later, it's going to be archived and will stay here on this Facebook uh, uh, program that we have uh, indefinitely. So you can always add a comment and we will search through those. And, and if there's a question there, we'll add it to the list for later. But I'll start with the ones that I have. The first one says that 1 Corinthians 13, 1 refers to the tongue of angels. The questioner says, I suppose that's a language. Is this the language used in the kingdom to come? What language will we use in the millennial kingdom and in eternity? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Where it refers to the tongues of angels, there must be some heavenly languages. We know something about speaking in tongues as Pentecostals. The glossolalia, which is the technical term for speaking in other tongues. It doesn't always mean speaking in an earthly language that maybe you have never learned. But sometimes though it does mean that. When the gift of the Holy Ghost was first poured out on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts, people from I think it was 17 different nations heard words spoken in the native languages of the countries that they were from. But those words were being spoken by unlearned Galileans. Um, Galileans were those who were in kind of a backwater country and were considered to be somewhat unsophisticated by the sophisticated world. Um, and yet these Galileans were able to speak in multiple different earthly languages. Acts 2 verses 7 and 8 says, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? 
So there are times when speaking in tongues means that someone is speaking words that are recognized as earthly languages. But there must also be times that there are no earthly languages that fit those words. And according to 1 Corinthians 13.1, that person may be speaking in the tongues of angels. They're not just speaking gibberish, but they're speaking the way angels communicate one with another. And the questioner asks if that will be the universal language of all creation by the end of the millennium. And to be honest, I really don't know. I can look at Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 9, where it says the Lord will restore a pure language. I don't know if that pure language is the tongue of angels. My mentor used to say it was probably a pure form of ancient Hebrew. But whatever that pure language is, it's going to undo the Babel effect. If you'll remember after the flood, men in their rebellion said, we'll build a tower that reaches into heaven and will not be scattered over the earth. We're going to stay together. And it was their language that allowed them to stay together and communicate one with another. But the Lord said in Genesis 11, verses 7 and 8, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Now, by confusing their tongues and giving them different languages, people who could speak together would go off in one direction, and people who could speak another language together went off in another direction, and they spread over the earth according to God's plan. But we've suffered with the Babel effect ever since. I have tried to learn other languages than English, and it is very hard. But part of paradise is going to be the ability to understand each other perfectly because of a pure universal language. Again, according to the promise in Zephaniah 3 and verse 9. Whether that's the tongue of, of angels or whether that's a, a pure language that Adam may have spoken in the garden, I really can't say. Time will tell. I just want to be there and find out. And I don't think it'll be hard to learn that language I think that's part of the increase in knowledge when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, as is promised in the prophecies of God's word. So really, that's the best I can do on that question. and I'll have to defer to others who may have additional knowledge on that. But I was also asked a second question, that is, what is the correct interpretation of Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 2? And if we turn to Ecclesiastes 10.2, it says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. <laughs> kind of funny phraseology, at least to our modern ears, but it made complete sense back when Solomon was writing these Proverbs. The reference certainly has nothing to do with the literal positioning of the human heart, because really the heart, if anything, it's a little bit toward the left side, and not toward the right hand. That pump of the blood is not really what Solomon's talking about. When he says a wise man's heart is at his right hand, you need to remember that the heart in the Bible is a reference to the seat of our emotions. We still say things like, I love you with all my heart, or you broke my heart, or my heart is in Texas. Uh, it's not a pumping organism or organ, but it's really a seat of emotions and thoughts and sentiments. And right hand and left hand are used in this saying of Solomon's uh, to point out what Jesus was saying when he talked about the separation of the sheep and the goats at the time of his judgment upon the nations. Um, at the close of the age, he said in Matthew uh, 25, starting about verse 31, for about 15 verses there, but he talks about how he's going to separate the sheep from the goats and the sheep are going to be on the right hand, and they're going to be blessed of the Father, and the goats are going to be on the left hand. See, the right hand and the right has been positively regarded since ancient times. It was the position, it was the direction uh, that uh, people would consider and, and look at. 
um, back in ancient times as one that was being blessed, um, a favor, a reward. You think of Jesus being told he can sit at the right hand of his father. And the left has been associated with disfavor and condemnation. Uh, you know, a lot of people are right-handed, and so somehow, I guess, uh, politically they had the power, and uh, the right hand got to be the one that people thought was the best. There's some evidence that all of the early civilizations of the world, from ancient Mesopotamians to the Egyptians to the Greeks, the Romans, they've been strongly biased toward the right hand. Um, it was the right hand of the gods was considered to be the one that was healing and blessing, and the left hand was used for curses and inflicting injury. Uh, ancient Egyptians were strongly anti-left-handed. They would depict their enemies as being left-handed. Uh, Romans, like uh, uh, Socrates and Aristotle, very wise people, but they were very biased toward the right hand for some reason. And in almost all these cultures, uh, the right hand was used for ceremonies and for eating, uh, and it was always the favored position to be at someone's right hand. And I guess that was true of ancient Israel as well. Uh, to be seated at the right hand was to be honored. Uh, Psalms 110 verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And Psalms 45 and verse 9, speaking of the bride, it says, Daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand did stand the queen in the gold of Ophir. Um, the right hand and the left hand was very important when Jacob was going to bless the two sons of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was the oldest there in Genesis 48, about starting about verse 12. And so he, uh, Joseph put Manasseh to the right side of of Jacob and Ephraim to the left. He thought that Jacob would put his right hand on Manasseh and his left hand on, on Ephraim because Manasseh was the oldest and should have had the birthright. But Jacob didn't do that. He reversed his hands. He put his left hand on Ephraim and his right hand, uh, I mean his left hand on Manasseh and his right hand on Ephraim. And Joseph said, no, no, you got it wrong, Dad. And jo Jacob said, no, I know it. He said, because the younger is going to be greater than the older. And Ephraim became greater, the tribe of Ephraim became greater than the tribe of Manasseh. Uh, you can read that in, in Genesis 48, about verses 12 through 20. So the right hand symbolizes strength, and the left hand symbolizes curses or weakness. Uh, and the dominant hand is always stronger on the arm, and 90% of the people are right-handed, so the right hand is usually stronger. And what Solomon is saying in this proverb that we're being asked about in Ecclesiastes is that to have your emotions where they're stronger. Make sure your emotions are strong, that they're not weak, that they don't run away with you, that you don't fall prey to emotions that are out of control, jealousy, rage, anger, those things. Make sure that you have a strong hold on your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence, the Bible says, for out of it are the issues of life. And keep your heart under your control uh, where your strength is on your right hand. And that's really what this was, was implying, what this scripture was referring to. Sister Julia, I believe we've had a question come in live. Yes. When we die, where does our soul go? Do we sleep until Jesus returns, or does our soul go back to God? When we die, where does our soul go? Do we sleep until Jesus returns, or does our soul go back to God? I will give you a brief answer tonight. I may need to spend a little more time uh, digging into the Word of God and giving you a little bit more complete answer later, but let's see how we do with this. See, there's, there's three parts to the man, to the human. There's the body, which is the external part, that's the cells, that's the organs, that's the blood, those things which are very physical. There's the soul, which is uh, different from the brain, but it's the seat of the emotions, the senses, and the will, the determination to act. And then there's a life-giving force called the spirit. 
Paul said this to the Thessalonians. He said, I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved unto the coming of the Lord Jesus. There's all those three parts. There's a, a scripture in the book of Psalms. I'd have to find it, but it talks about, to, to uh, it refers to the hidden part and the secret part. The hidden part of man is, is the soul, and the secret part is the spirit. And the spirit, in the Greek, the word is pneuma, um, and uh, it has to do with breath. Even today they refer to uh, uh, pneumatology as the, as the study of breathing or the respiratory part. You inspire, you expire. Um, but the, uh, the Ruah in the Old Testament is that spirit. But that's what comes from God. When God breathed into Adam, he became a living soul. He already had a body. He started out with a body. God formed a body out of the dust of the earth. But there was no life there. There was no soul there uh, until God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Uh, the breath of God is, is the spirit that he put in man. And it takes a body combined with a spirit to produce a soul. The soul cannot exist without them. When the spirit departs, the body dies and the soul uh, ceases to exist. Uh, and it will come back uh, when God reunites a body and a spirit in the resurrection. But when Solomon was writing about death in the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, he talks about uh, old age and how you're going to, to die. He gets down to verse 7 of chapter 12 and says, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. That's the body. And the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So the spirit is what goes back to God. And when you separate the spirit and the body, then the soul dies. Um, and dies the sleep of death. And uh, in the resurrection, the Lord is going to breathe that spirit back into a body. He's going to change our vile bodies to make it like unto his glorious body. Uh, there are going to be bodies uh, celestial and bodies terrestrial. He's going to give it a body as it pleases him. But when he puts that spirit back in, that soul that went to sleep, uh, they said Lazarus is is just sleeping, uh, but he was dead. They knew he was dead. Um, but Jesus put the spirit back in Lazarus and his soul came to life again. And that's what's going to happen in the resurrection. Into a body is going to come the spirit of God, the life force of God, and that soul that was asleep is going to reawaken in the resurrection uh, and come to life again. And I believe that that soul is going to possess the same intellect, the same sensibilities, the same willpower, have the memories. It'll have all of those things that made you, you. Uh, but you will have learned your lessons through this life and won't be uh, delving back into sin because you will have learned those things. You will have overcome those things. Now, I've said a lot and I've referred to some scriptures without turning to each one and and giving you reference and quoting it. And so if you would like additional information, if you want a more complete explanation, of an answer, then please uh, resubmit your request again, asking for additional clarification. And we'll work on doing that next week. Uh, we'll put it on our list of questions for next week, as I can talk a little bit more then about the spirit, the soul, and the body. Next, I was asked um, to please give the qualifications for an apostle. Now, I can only answer that question as I understand the Word of God. I'll tell you that there are some ministers who will not see it quite the same way as I do. There are some who claim to be apostles today, but I don't think that any man alive meets the biblical qualifications for that office, the office of an apostle. What is an apostle? Well, in short, it is a specially commissioned 
official representative of a powerful official. An apostle not only comes with a message, he has the authority of the official who sent him. An apostle of Jesus Christ doesn't just have the word of God, but he has the authority of Jesus. Jesus is the one who sent him. The literal meaning of the word apostle is that one who sent forth, or a builder. An apostle is literally sent forth by Jesus Christ, and that apostle establishes the saints of God in the truth. Um, in, um, <clears throat> Paul would say this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 10, he said, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. See, Paul wasn't just a builder, he wasn't just a laborer, he wasn't just a construction worker. He was a master builder. The Greek word is architectone, uh, and it means the chief constructor. It's a very important, very high position. Um, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 2, Paul reminded the saints that he was responsible for their place in God. He said, If I be not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. And the work of establishing those saints is found in Romans, I think it's 1 and verse 11, where Paul said, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. The apostle has the authority to really establish saints. And the work of an apostle is not limited to just one local church like a pastor might be, but it's used to build up the entire body of Christ wherever those assemblies may be located. See, the apostle Paul sent an authoritative epistle to the church in Rome. Even though he had not built that church, and in fact had never ever been there, but yet he had the authority to even deal with problems in that church. He may not have ever been in the church in Colossae when he wrote the epistle to the Colossians. There's some verses in the first chapter of Colossians that give me that impression. Verse 4 says, since we heard of your faith in Jesus and of the love that you have to all the saints. Verses 7 and 8 says, we learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. He had heard about them from other ministers, and he wrote them an authoritative epistle that's still in our Bible today. I don't think there's any other office in the ministry that's as authoritative as that of the apostle. He stands next to Christ. He's given special authority directly from Jesus. Um, and uh, apostles are eyewitnesses who can verify that Jesus rose from the dead. Um, that's one of the things that was said about the original apostles in Acts the first chapter when they were appointing Matthias to take the apostleship that Judas Iscariot had forfeited. They said he must be ordained to be a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, because of who they are and what their commission is, these men can specifically and literally establish through their own eyesight that Jesus is risen from the dead. I believe there's four signs or four qualifications of an apostle. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul said, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Um, uh, and anyone who doesn't meet all four of these qualifications is not an apostle, as I understand the Bible. Now, they may be called of God to the ministry. They may be powerful preachers. They may be very effective leaders in the body of Christ. But in my understanding of the New Testament, they're not an apostle unless they meet all four of these qualifications. And perhaps it's best if I go through these qualifications for the office of apostle one by one. But first let me reiterate that an apostle, the Greek word is apostolos, is authorized to speak for the ruler. 
He's not just a spokesman, but he's clothed with the authority to act in the name of the ruler. When Caesar would send an apostolos to a region, that man had the authority of Rome. His decisions were the law. He didn't just deliver a message from Caesar. He acted with the governmental authority. And even so, an apostle in the church won't just speak for Jesus like a prophet or a teacher would, but he has heavenly governmental authority. Paul's authority was seen in how he dealt with Elimus, a sorcerer, in Acts 13. Verses 10 and 11, Paul turned to this sorcerer and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind and not see the sun for a season. And immediately there fell upon him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. That apostolic authority is something that I don't wield as a pastor or maybe, maybe as a teacher, whatever my calling is. Uh, I don't have the authority to strike a man blind in the name of Jesus. Paul had that kind of authority. And only the Lord can make a man an apostle in the body of Christ. Galatians 1 and verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who hath raised him from the dead. That's where the commission comes, from Jesus and from God the Father. So what are the four qualifications? I say there are four that I recognize from the scriptures. I'll go through them. Number one, an apostle must have personally seen the risen Lord. The first sign of an apostle is that he must have personally seen the Lord, not in a dream or a vision, but face to face. In Acts 1 and verse 22, the apostles were needing to replace Judas. They knew that whoever took that apostleship had to be a witness of his resurrection. And Acts 1 22 says that this man must, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Now Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He said so directly in Romans 11, 13. But Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus to make him a minister, but also an apostle and a witness. When he was reiterating how that happened in Acts 26, 16, Paul quoted the Lord as saying, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which I will appear unto thee. See, the Lord was saying, I've appeared unto you personally right now, and I will appear unto you more. That's really where Paul got his message. I'll get to that point in a minute. But Paul had actually seen the risen Christ. He said this in Acts no, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, in verse 1, he said, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? But that question, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes, he had. That was his credentials. That's what he was using. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, Paul said he'd saw the resurrected Jesus as one that was born out of due season. Now I'll tell you that no one sign, no one test alone is sufficient to qualify a man as an apostle because I'm sure many people saw the Lord after his resurrection. Paul said over 500 brethren at one time. But only the ones that he named apostles when he called 12 of them to be apostles. Um, Those are the ones that are called to that office. But one of the qualifications is that they have to be directly called in a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus. The second one is what I'm getting to, and that is they must be personally called to that office. They can't decide for themselves. They can't have others say, well, you are an apostle. 
uh, Jesus has to directly, face to face, commission them to be an apostle. Uh, they're not commissioned by the church, not by a preacher. See, in Luke 6, verse 13, it says that Jesus gathered his disciples. I don't know how many there were at that point. But from those that he had, he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. This was before the day of Pentecost, but he was already clothing them with authority. And he was going to send them out to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out devils. He was giving them apostolic authority when he was sending them out. Uh, Paul was called directly to be an apostle. As I read to you, Galatians 1 and verse 1, where he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, some may claim the office, but they don't have the call. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 1, Paul wrote that he was an apostle by the commandment of God. And in Romans 1, 1, he said he was called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel. This calling of the Lord is also mentioned in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. But it's a direct call personally received from Jesus Christ. Then the third sign, and this is a very, very important one, very crucial. That is that, that an apostle is given a revelation of the truth. Apostles are men called to that office who've been given a supernatural understanding of true doctrine. This is more than just being taught of man. It's being taught a message directly from the Lord. Paul gloried in the fact that he was not taught his message from some man. He received it by revelation. Galatians 1, let me read verses 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus revealed the truth directly, probably in a personal encounter, not just on the road to, to Damascus, but there were other appearances. Perhaps when Paul was in Arabia, for years before he uh, was found by Barnabas and brought to the church at Antioch. But the Lord was teaching him the truth, the whole truth and the nothing but the truth, just like he taught it to Peter and James and John personally. Paul said in Ephesians 3 verses 2 and 3 that the Lord made the mystery known to him by revelation. The Lord revealed it to him. In 1 Corinthians 11 verses 23 and 24, Paul was instructing the church in the ordinance of communion, how it was to be handled. Uh, and as he did so, he actually quoted the words of Jesus, even though he wasn't there when Jesus instituted communion at the Last Supper, right before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. But he knew exactly what Jesus said, and yet he wasn't taught that of men. The Lord had to reveal that to him directly. Now, this kind of direct revelation is not given to other offices in the ministry. It's only given to an apostle. The fact that he receives his message directly from Jesus Christ means that a true apostle speaks only true doctrine when he preaches what the Lord has directly given him. I know I mentioned that earlier, but I think it's worth emphasizing again because it goes directly to my point that there are no true apostles today. We don't have guarantors of truth. Um, we need them. I believe the Lord will give us that gift and must do so in order to restore the church. But if you wanted to know whether you moved out a live soul or whether you slept until the resurrection, all you had to do in the early church was ask Peter because he knew the truth. If you wanted to know if there's a personal devil or if the flesh is just the devil, all you had to do was ask Paul because he knew the truth. We don't have men who are that versed in truth. We have good men. I love them. I honor them. I respect them. 
I respect their teachings, even those that I don't necessarily understand or agree with. But we need apostles if we're going to restore the church. Uh, a restored church with the truth and the, the early church is going to require apostles who have directly received their message from Jesus Christ and who agree among themselves. There was no disagreement between Paul and John. There was no disagreement between uh, Simon Zelotes and uh, Thomas. They had all been taught by Jesus, and they had the truth. Paul received it by revelation, but he had the truth. And when he compared his doctrine in Jerusalem with the beliefs of the apostles that were in Jerusalem, they extended to him the right hand of fellowship. If we had a group of apostles who each one who had individually received a revelation directly of truth, and those men could be guarantors of truth, then we would see the scripture fulfilled that says the watchman will see eye to eye when the Lord restores Zion. There will be an eye to eye understanding. And that's why this is so important. In fact, the primary test for whether a book was included in the New Testament or not was that those New Testament books had to be written either by an apostle or under the authority of apostle by someone like Luke. That's because the revelation of truth that the apostles preached was accurate. An apostle and an apostle alone could speak virtually infallibly with divine authority when it comes to the truth. And then the fourth sign of an apostle is an extraordinary power to work miracles. Um, Acts 19.11 says that God wrought special miracles by Paul. Now these were more than just an occasional healing. They were more than just the result of the prayer of faith. When Jesus commissioned his twelve with special powers, he told them to heal the sick, to cast out devils, and even to raise the dead. I believe an apostle will do more miracles than those who hold other offices in the ministry. 2 Corinthians 12.12 12 states that there are signs of an apostle, signs, wonders, and mighty deeds. And God himself bears witness with those signs, with those wonders, with those mighty miracles. This is important because even in the early church there were men claiming to be apostles who weren't. Paul referred to them in 2 Corinthians and he said they were troubling churches. In 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 14, he speaks of false apostles because they had not seen the risen Lord and were not directly commissioned by him and given a direct revelation of truth and did not have the extraordinary power to work miracles. These false apostles carried letters of commendation from men. But a true apostle doesn't need letters of commendation. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 1. So I believe a five-fold ministry in a restored church will include pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, but emphatically it will include apostles. And we will need the apostolic office in order to have those watchmen see eye to eye, in order to have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, in order to see the miracles that we expect to see in an end-time church at the close of this age, a church that's able to finish the work that the Lord commissioned his church to do. So that's my understanding of the office of apostle and why I don't believe there are any apostles with us today, but I fervently hope and pray for that day, looking for that day when the Lord will restore that office and give us those guarantors of truth by personally appearing and commissioning men to that office. So that's all the questions that I've had submitted for tonight. I certainly do appreciate your interest. I hope something that we've said here will be spiritually beneficial and uplifting to you. And I encourage you to continue to send in questions as comments to this post so that we can address those next week in our Bible study program. Until then, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen.